Now then, welcome along. So, uh, football show is coming at you. Pat Nevin will join us later on. In the meantime, very happy to say Simon Cooper is with us. Gary Lineker uh, back on the BBC. Tim Davey denies it's a climb down, Simon, but when it looks like a climb down, smells like a climb down, I don't know. Uh, perhaps it is something of a climb down. Uh, give us your, your broad sweep, first of all, on an extraordinary few days. I mean, it shows how the issue of BBC impartiality has been nagging away at Brits for seven years, really, since Brexit. When the Brexiteers started to uh, weaponize the BBC, which is a long tradition, saying, you know, the BBC were all these liberal, Ramona, middle class types out of touch with the population. And they had to get on board and just um, just be populist as well. And Lineker, strangely, in the last few years, along with other celebrities like Hugh Grant and J.K. Rowling and Figgul Sharkey, the singer, became a kind of voice of liberal Britain. In Lineker's case, opposing Brexit and also advocating for refugees. He took in at least one refugee into his house and he's always spoken out, I think, very humanely for them against the tabloids and taking on the tabloids is a brave thing to do in Britain. So Lineker became one of the kind of flashpoints of the culture war and footballers in general, you know, in England, with the England team taking the knee, which again provoked uh, the far right. Football has taken the strangely liberal position. And so the flashpoint came this week and it was particularly poignant because, you know, BBC chiefs were saying he wasn't impartial when Lineker said that the government's language on refugees was reminiscent of Germany of the 1930s. And so he was told he had to be impartial. And, you know, liberals got very upset because the chairman of the BBC is a conservative donor who brokered a loan, personal loan for Boris Johnson, or tried to. Uh, the head of the BBC, uh, Director General Tim Davey, is a former conservative local party candidate. Robbie Gibb, who sits on the BBC board, is a former communications chief for Theresa May, who was accused by Emily Maitlis of having been a Conservative Party agent inside the BBC. So uh, suddenly it's Lineker who's the impartiality pro uh, problem. So as I say, a huge culture war there, and Lineker is, is kind of the tip of the liberal spear. Something I was very curious about, and you may have a sense of this, or I may be asking you to speculate too much. This was billed by various observers, for instance, Alistair Campbell. This was billed as uh, Tory politicians putting immense pressure, pressure, vicious pressure, we will defund you uh, to do something about Lineker. Now, is, is that the characterization uh, you would agree with? Or I can't work out, and we'll, we'll come on to Chums, your book, in a few moments' time, if it was far more chummy, and if it was an old phone call here and a, hey, listen, old pal, why don't you do something about old Lineker there? I mean, the way aggressive governments always put pressure on the BBC is to threaten to defund them. And so this was an issue in Margaret Thatcher's time. It's a threat that as a government you wield against the BBC and it makes sure that they don't offend the government too much, don't upset the government too much. So Lineker is just one more reason to, you know, wheel that out. But certainly, I mean, in the Johnson era, Johnson's appointees were typically people who he knew in some way, and Richard Sharp, the chairman, was one of them. Yeah, I mean, it, it's government through WhatsApp. It's a national network of Oxbridge and private school old boys who understand each other very quickly because even if they weren't contemporaries, they came through the same institutions. So a quick call can set a lot of things right. Let's talk a bit about these institutions. So, uh, and, and this Lineker example weirdly gives us license to on a, on a sports show. Uh, so you wrote this fantastic book that we would highly recommend, Chums, How a Tiny Cast of Oxford Tories Took Over the UK. And uh, you yourself went to Oxford, so you have an uh, in, intrinsic understanding of the place. As an aside, I was watching, <laughs> when I knew I was going to be talking to you, uh, there's a very good series uh Fleischman has a problem. Uh, it's, it's a drama series on uh, Disney at the moment. And so uh, Fleischman going through a divorce is a, a doctor on the Upper East Side earning 300,000 a year. And when he meets his wife's friends and they find out he's a doctor, they look at him with sympathy and say, oh, well, good for you. I'm wondering if your Oxford uh, contemporaries look at you when they see you went into journalism and, and, and say, well, good for you, Simon. I mean, I think, strangely, most people who go to Oxford and Cambridge don't actually enter the elite. 
And so my mates have ended up in, I think, mostly quite disappointing uh, middle class <laughs> jobs in the provinces with, you know, difficult spouses and paying off the mortgage. These people are certainly not running the country. Okay. So it's not the case that everybody who comes out of Oxford becomes Boris Johnson or Rishi Sunak. If you limit it to people who went to the most exclusive private schools like Sunak's Winchester or Johnson's Eton, you get slightly closer to that kind of vision of the elites. Okay. So no, I mean, my friends would be more likely to ask me if I could lend them a bit of cash. <laughs> uh, let's, um, and I think people are vaguely aware of this, but the numbers are kind of extraordinary. Let's just um, I, I flesh out how uh, prevalent Oxford is on the CV of prime ministers. Yeah, so since 1940, Britain has had 17 prime ministers, 13 went to Oxford, including the last five since David Cameron, all Oxford Tory prime ministers. Uh, three didn't go to university, Churchill, John Major and uh, Jim Callaghan. And the only person to go to another university was Gordon Brown, who went to Edinburgh because the Scottish elite has a slightly different route. So Oxford's dominance is extraordinary. Uh, you use a quote at the start of your book, that Napoleon quote, to understand the man, you have to understand the world as it was when they were 20. So... Uh, this, you know, this tiny elite of, of British society when they were 20 at Oxford, what, what world did they inhabit? I mean, the people who are more my contemporaries are like David Cameron, Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, uh, which is a generation that fought out Brexit. I mean, the world that they inhabited was one very much dominated by white public school boys. And they knew they were going to run the country. They'd known it from age days. And there wasn't really much competition from the nation's other ranks. And the other thing that was happening is just about three weeks before Jacob Brees Mogg, my exact contemporary, and I started at Oxford, Margaret Thatcher made her famous Bruce speech where she warned of a European super state exercising the new dominance from Brussels. And that really frightened these guys because they thought, hang on, I'm going to run the country. I'm going to be a minister. I might be prime minister. Like everyone in my class, I have a real shot at it. And now... Maggie, our hero, is telling us that, in fact, Brussels is usurping those jobs. And most of the population didn't care because, you know, if you're working class in Liverpool, nobody's asking you to run the country. And whether the country is run by some elite, out-of-touch elite in Westminster or an out-of-touch elite in Brussels, you don't really care. You have other issues. But for these guys, uh, Thatcher kind of sounds the warning knell about Europe, and that becomes then more and more over the next 30 years, their battle. And they're also looking for a great project because, you know, their fathers and grandfathers, you know, fought two world wars and ran the empire. And what have they got? They're in this kind of mid-ranking European country. So they look for a great project. And in the end, that becomes Brexit. And am I right in saying that around the time Major, uh, and I actually, I didn't realise he hadn't gone to university. That's quite interesting. But around the time Major's um, signing the Maastricht Treaty, almost, uh, and, and this is in your book, and it's very much your theory, not mine, but it's fascinating. Around the time Major is signing the Maastricht Treaty, like the beginnings, like the real beginnings in an Oxford coffee shop, coffee shop of, of Brexit are beginning maybe to bubble. Yeah, it's astonishing. So this is, I think, December 1990, and Daniel Hanan and a couple of other private school boys, Oxford contemporaries, He's a, Dan Hanan is a first year at Oxford, but he really doesn't want, you know, Westminster's powers to be signed away to Brussels by major. And so they sit together and they cook up the Oxford campaign for an independent Britain. And within a few months, it's become the second biggest political society at the university. It's got hundreds of members, maybe thousands. And they run this anti-European campaign. And then Dan Hanan goes to London and he becomes the first secretary of the European Research Group, now the famous ERG. And so for 25 years, he fights the battle for Brexit. So in the book, I say Dan Hanan is really the Karl Marx of Brexit. He's the visionary with the great idea. And he gets Gove to jump on board. And most importantly, at the end, Boris Johnson. Um, to, to a point here, I mean, maybe Cameron had a bit more substance, I suppose. Johnson maybe is the, the like most grotesque illustration of uh, the types of people who seem to be emerging and, and going into politics and getting all the way to the very top, which is they speak very well and I, and I suspect they can write very eloquently. And, you know, uh, Johnson is this wonderfully entertaining speaker. Uh, zero detail, zero preparation behind it. He'll throw in a quote from the classics and uh, you make the point, th this is very much shaped in, in their school atmosphere and, and culture, that, that those assets of speaking very eloquently and writing eloquently and entertainingly, they are prized far and above 
detail, reading all the literature, all the books, uh, doing all the work? Yeah. So in the British tradition, uh, Oxford and public school teach you especially to write and speak well. So the Oxford education revolves around essays. You write one or two a week about a subject about which you know almost nothing. You present it to a tutor who's an expert on the subject. You know, he or she points out the holes in your essay and you spend the hour debating with the tutor, arguing your way around the tutor's very valid criticism. So what you learn in the educational process is above all to write and speak well. And then the Oxford Union, which is where the Oxford Tories go and sort of practice their political rhetoric, is again a, a training in eloquent speech. And it's not so much about detail, which is considered boring. So at the Union, if somebody uh, mentioned a fact, um, people would shout, facts, facts as a criticism, they would barrack the speaker. And you also, you know, it's an education that privileges the humanities. So the high status degrees are history or English or classics in that class. Maths not. And you see that in the WhatsApps, the very funny WhatsApps that have emerged, grotesquely funny, um, out of Matt Hancock's account uh, given to us by Isabel Oakshoss in the last few weeks. You see these arguments between people who can't do maths about how to evaluate the pandemic. So uh, Johnson gets percentages mixed up, uh, mixes up the case fatality rate and the infection fatality rate, which are important things to understand the beginning of a pandemic that's going to kill hundreds of thousands of British people. But he doesn't because he did classics. Wow. Uh, did Gove go to Oxford? Gove, of course, went to Oxford. He was uh, Boris Johnson's campaign manager when Johnson became union president. Later, Gove became union president. Gove did an English degree. Virtually everyone at the top of the Tory party and many at the top of Labour went to Oxford. I mean, Keir Starmer went, did his undergraduates at Leeds and then came to Oxford for two years, yeah. uh, joined the Labour Club, did his degree there, did a graduate degree there. I just asked because, may, you know, one of the defining lines of the last decade in British politics is people have had enough of experts in this country, Michael Gove, and, and just now the image of him shouting facts, facts as a criticism during a debate, you know, it, it is quite extraordinary. So to to, um, to to kind of get a sense of where we are now, uh, the, the whole thing feels just more um, like when we talk about Lineker, just so unimportant, like it's just the latest uh, hollow, empty culture war, a great scandal for a few days and will and will disappear and be forgotten just as quickly. And um, talk to us, I suppose, about this generation uh, you know, the first the first grouping where the prime ministers hadn't been part of world wars because for, for a, a, you know, the Oxford elite was very much a, a part of the story for many, many uh, decades previous to Thatcher. But you do make the observation that those prime ministers had experienced war and this this latest generation, it's almost a bit feckless. They don't know what to be doing. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the very distinctive things about British life, public life from, say, the 20s to the 80s, is it's dominated by men who had fought in one of the world wars. And that had given them a kind of seriousness. They knew that if, you know, politics went wrong, terrible things happened. So Harold Macmillan, who is kind of, in some ways, the Boris Johnson of a century ago, you know, Balliol College, Classics, Eton, uh, and he's running to be librarian of the Union in summer 1914, when he's called away from Oxford by grace of things. And he ends up spending years in the trenches. He's wounded three times. You know, he sits in a shell hole for hours with a dying German uh, reciting Euclid to himself. And Macmillan and Clement Attlee, who also fought in World War One at Gallipoli, and Anthony Eden, who won, I think, a military cross for carrying back a sergeant from no man's land who lost two of his brothers, I believe, in the war. These men... They came from the same backgrounds as Johnson and Cameron, but they acquired a kind of seriousness. And they also had, for the first time in their lives, a very intimate contact with the working classes because these, you know, private school officers became lieutenants and captains. And they were responsible for platoons of privates, working class men. And if they died, it was the lieutenant who wrote a letter to the guy's mother. And if the guy died because of a mistake by the lieutenant, the guy felt guilty for his whole life. So what they took away from war is, you know, we are one nation. And okay, we're the high and they're the low, but we're responsible for their well being. And that was a sense, for example, that Macmillan, who later represented a mining town in the Northeast as an MP, he felt very seriously all his life, we, we owe it to these people. 
And it's an experience that Johnson and Cameron and Rees Mogg never had. You know, we, I'm of their generation. It was the luckiest generation uh, in British history. Then they were the luckiest members of it. And so nothing could really go wrong. And if you did Brexit, it didn't work out. Well, you know, who cares? Some working class people might suffer, but you don't really meet them. Mm. Um, with this Lineker situation, it's hard to tell, but the polling would suggest the majority of the country just about are in his corner. Uh, I saw a poll in the Telegraph, which had support for Lineker at about uh, 51, 52 percent and uh, support for, I suppose, BBC slash toy pressure at maybe 25 percent and then a quotient who didn't know. So that that's healthy ish. Um, and that's my that's my kind of anecdotal feeling on, on the level of support for Lineker. Which is why well. the BBC crumbled as well. Yes, correct. So uh, why do they keep voting in these lads to government if they're, you know, they I don't think they're going to do it again. And I think Johnson was a a very good candidate. I think Corbyn was a bad candidate. And uh, Johnson is a con man, but he's very good at being a con man. And now that he's been in governments and people say, see that he's not interested in government and he has no morals and scruples, I don't think they want him back. But he's a brilliant election winner, or he was until 2019. And, you know, a lot of the, you know, Brexit was a great story because it was a dream. You know, Remain was a reality. Things aren't great, but, you know, it could be worse. Yeah. And that's not a great story to tell. Yeah. Brexit was any fantasy you wanted, any grievance you had, you could attach to Brexit. So I think that they've run their course. I I think you can con people for a long time, but after 12 years, you're done. Also, austerity. I mean, you know, the six years before Brexit was absolutely disastrous. The Economist calculates that a quarter of a million Brits, even leaving aside COVID, a quarter of a million Brits died too early in the last decade, probably as a result of rising obesity and uh, austerity. Uh, You know, numbers for countries like France and Denmark and Holland are much, much better. Yeah. So, you know, it really has been awful. And when you say they're done, I mean, I, this government is is done. I mean, it's on fumes and has been for some time. But this, I, I was asking when I said electing these lads, I'm talking about this trend, this mm. this ancient British uh, reflex to say Oxford, Eton, that's our prime minister, while at the same time resenting their wealth and their status. Uh, do you think that's done? I think a certain kind of Oxford is done. I think the Eton and Oxford thing is going to be turned down to a very low heat for maybe forever. So, you know, rewriting chums for the paperback, which is out, I can advertise this in a couple of weeks. I was really struck and impressed by how much Oxford and Cambridge in the last five years since 2017 have really reformed their admissions. So now they have two thirds of their admissions are from state schools, which is probably a record in both universities history. And more than that, they're reaching out in a way that surprised me to find truly disadvantaged bright people and bring them in. And so the the grumble among private school parents is it's impossible to get into Oxford from private schools anymore. That's not true. Still, Oxford takes one third from private schools, their British intake, which is way above, you know, the 10 percent or so of kids who can finish school or private school. But it is a lot harder. And, you know, one tutor at Oxford said to me, he said, there is no way a Boris Johnson would get in now. Somebody with a kind of silver tongue who hadn't done the homework doesn't really happen anymore. Oh, interesting. So interesting. I'm, I'm very, I'm very struck. So I think Oxford is going to continue to produce the elite. But remember, you know, of those 13 prime ministers, a lot of them were from quite ordinary backgrounds. Ted Heath, Margaret Thatcher, Harold Wilson, they're among that. And so I think Oxford is going to reach out and try to find more of that kind of person, if you like. Okay. Because it was, I mean... <laughs> Uh, it, it was always kind of surprising when you seem to get a glimpse of the lifestyle of these various prime ministers, that there was a lot of partying and hanging out with pigs and not much studying going on. And I thought, well, is this not like the university that's produced all sorts of Nobel Prize winners and done amazing things? How are these lads passing the exams was almost uh, a, a routine question. I mean, at Oxford in the 80s and 90s, you could work if you wanted to, that was fine. And some people really wanted to, like, you know, I know Stephen Hawking. But if you didn't want to work, like Boris Johnson, you didn't have to. It was totally your own choice. Okay. Uh, What's your sense of how they interact with sport and football, Simon? Like in this country, in every country, sport is um, manipulated for political gain. 
Uh, the Tories over the last couple of years uh, between the taking of the knee and, and to an extent, I know this is BBC that we're talking about, so I don't want to conflate too much, but uh, to an extent, this Lineker situation, they seem to, every time they, they go near football, uh, come out badly burned or misreading the room. Yeah, so the Tories have this populism that, you know, we're in touch with the with the common man and woman on the street. We know what they think and you liberal elites don't. But clearly in Britain, any analysis of suddenly the common man on the street is that he really likes football. I mean, you know, we agree, right? And um, when the Tories touch football, they tend to be very bad at it because almost none of them have ever had any experience of it because they didn't play football at Eton. Sunak is unusual in that he's also of a generation like Prince William, where even the posh schools were starting to play football because football was sweeping the country. So Sunak is a genuine Southampton fan, just like Prince William is a genuine football fan. So sort of the early 40s and younger, some of those people do have uh, an understanding of football, although probably not of the common Britain. So, yeah, for now, uh, football keeps blowing up in their faces. I mean, what I've taken away, one of the things I've taken away from this Lineker spat is that British football has a kind of ethic now, which is, is very greedy. Uh, anyone's money is welcome and will eat it up, whether it's Saudi or Qatari or American, no problem. But it's also got this kind of uh, non-racial or anti-racist uh, multiculturalism wrapped into it because, you know, about 40% of players in the Premier League are black in the England team as well. And if you work in that industry, even if you're white, a lot of your colleagues are black and that kind of tends to in induce a tolerance. And so football people tend to be, I think, on the whole, quite genuinely anti-racist now. And Lineker, I mean, Lineker is unusual in that he was always a forthright liberal. But I think his support for refugees, you saw it also with the players who didn't want to speak to Match of the Day when it seemed that Match of the Day would still be broadcast. They didn't want to speak to Match of the Day. They were showing solidarity with Lineker. Uh, so I think among the players, those views are quite strong as well, on average. Yes, and, and actually that point extends to the taking of the knee at the Euros and uh, Pretty Patel and, and uh, Tyrone Mings getting into a, a massive Twitter bust up and, and he was saying, you know, I think the Tories realised they were at a step quite late on when they saw the applause for the taking of the knee at that championships and Patel tried to support it and, and Mings uh, beautifully shot her down on Twitter. I don't know the exact wording, but effectively he was saying, you can't fan the flames of what we're protesting against and now suddenly circle around and think that we're great and put on the England shirt. And again, it was the Tories misjudging that whole area. Yeah, and I mean, you know, a white man like Gareth Southgate, who, if he'd have worked in another industry, might not have had many contact, much contact with black people. Yeah. I mean, he's talked about how he came to understand the position of black people in British life from, you know, contact with friends and colleagues and dressing rooms over the years, and how that helped open his eyes and turn him into a, a kind of multicultural liberal that maybe he wasn't from the start. And I think that's a very uh, that's a very common and healthy experience in football that you'd wish that people in other fields had as well. Uh, I wouldn't say that I, I had uh, extraordinary sympathy for the BBC and their impartiality, but uh, I did understand the sense that well, Lineker had uh, tweeted a strong view, political view, uh, against the government, and you know, I, I, a lot of the support for him was because most people thought. Well, he's a, a voice of empathetic uh, reason. But, you know, if he'd been tweeting strongly in favour of it and, you know, they, they should actually have made that wave machine that Pretty Patel was talking about a few years ago and really, you know, send those dinghies uh, flying, then a lot more people would have said, oh, well, hang on here, you can't be tweeting this if you're part of the BBC. People liked the opinion, but there is uh, very much the kernel of a, a point of principle there for the BBC as well at the same time. Where are you on that issue? Well, look, I, I would be in favour of very strict impartiality guidelines that, or I, I would understand strict impartiality guidelines that said presenters shouldn't have a, shouldn't speak out about politics. If you're paid by the BBC, you don't speak politics. However, in past years, when Alan Sugar said vote Tory while presenting The Apprentice, which has bigger viewing figures, had bigger viewing figures than Match of the Day, when Jeremy Clarkson said that the strikers should be shot uh, when people were on strike, public sector workers should be shot in front of their families, also presenting a BBC programme, that was allowed. So you get the sense with Lineker being shut down is that the people at the top of the BBC are the, the people who run the place are predominantly conservatives. They're appointees of the conservative government and they want to shut down people saying anti-conservative things. If you say something conservative, so if Lineker had said, I love this refugees policy, don't let a single one of them into the country, 
uh, the public, some of the public might have been against him. I'm not, I'm not sure how many, mm. but the government would probably have been fine. So if, yes, let's have very serious and clear impartiality guidelines that apply to whatever the political opinion is that you are espousing. And, for example, the BBC chairman should not be a donor to a political party or a mate of the prime minister's. So I would hope that what we take out of this is that we move to a much more genuinely impartial BBC with much clearer rules, which we don't have now. So one last area, and I, I don't fully understand the let's defund the BBC, get rid of the BBC. It's, it's, it's another one of these um, seemingly Tory essentials. And yet we're talking about an organisation which seems to be run by Conservatives and, uh, you know, I, impartial or, or right leaning at the top. Uh, so why are the why did the Tories want to defund the BBC? And, and, and is the BBC under genuine threat here? There's always pressure on the BBC. The, the Tories, uh, misname, misnamed Conservatives, take on everything in British life that works brilliantly, the few things that do, and try and destroy it. The universities, um, absolutely damaged by Brexit and then uh, threatened to lose their research funding, which is the highest of any European university, the highest of any European universities. The BBC, which is listened to by people around the world, which is a fantastic soft power advert for Britain. The city, which, like it or not, is the heart of the British economy, has stagnated um, since 28 and has been hit in the stomach by Brexit. And, you know, the one the one jewel of British life, you know, like it or not again, but very successful, is the Premier League that seems to have survived uh, Tory onslaught for now. So, uh, yes, I'm very baffled that you would run a country and you would take on all its strong points and try and weaken them. Yeah. But that's what they do. Yeah, I've never had a good answer to that. because I And you've explained it so well and it's so interesting uh, the Brexit, because Brexit didn't make sense to me either. But now you paint these guys in their formative years being told your birthright is about to be taken by Brussels. I mean, you, that your whole your whole career where you were going to run the show, run this country from Westminster has been stolen by Brussels. I understand that Brexit motivation, but BBC, I still I don't get it. They, I mean, the thing about Cameron, he was an institutionalist. He actually sort of believed in and loved British institutions. Right. As soon as you start a revolution, which is, you know, Brexit is a kind of fake revolution, you, you start to burn down the institutions. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, pleasure and, and fascinating as always, Simon. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. That's Simon Cooper there, and he mentioned uh, Chums coming out in uh, paperback very soon. So it's Chums, how a tiny cast of Oxford Tories took over the UK. I do appreciate it's a touch outside the parameters of just Lineker, but um, sketching that context we thought was uh, worth doing. We'll take a very short break. Football on Off the Ball. With Sky, proud partner and supporter of the Republic of Ireland women's national football team. This is News Talk.